Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Michael Graves, who died recently at the age of 80, and he was one of America's foremost architects and designers. CNN said that Michael Graves was one of the most revered contemporary architects, known for his postmodern designs, and he won hundreds of prizes in his field. He started his practice in 1964 and designed over 400 buildings worldwide. Architecture critics hailed him as one of the original American voices in architecture as he has designed hundreds of buildings for corporations, governments, foundations, and universities. Among his noted works are the Portland Building in Oregon, the Humana Building in Louisville, Kentucky, the NCAA Hall of Champions in Indiana, and the Team Disney Building in Burbank, California. He was praised for making buildings functional as well as aesthetically pleasing. For many Americans, Graves might be best known as the designer of household items. One of his best known designs was the Alessi stainless steel tea kettle with a red bird at the tip that sang when water had boiled. Graves helped propel Target and its collaborations with designers to massive popularity. His line for Target included practical items from tea kettles and drying racks to whimsical kitchen equipment like an avocado scooper and large bamboo salad tongs. His target line came with a simple, idealistic premise that good design should be affordable to all. His designs were also sold at J.C. Penney and Black & Decker. He was awarded the National Medal of the Arts, as well as the Dry House Prize for Classical Architecture. I just want to say that I'm no expert on architecture, but I've been to Louisville and I've seen that Humana building, and I don't know, to me it looks like a giant cash register. On the other hand, they just sort of in line with the medical profession today. We're going to move on now to Al Rosen, who died recently at the age of 91, a legend in Cleveland Indian history. I think he's also indisputably the greatest player turned front office executive in baseball history, and he should be in the Hall of Fame along with his teammate Minnie Minoso. He was a nice Jewish boy from Spartanburg, South Carolina. He came to the Indians after service in World War II. He was part of their 1948 championship team of their great teams from the 50s. He was a third baseman and he led the league at home runs his rookie year and he was the most valuable player in the league in 1953, coming one hit from winning the Triple Crown. Had injuries not slowed him, he almost certainly would be in the Hall of Fame for his playing career alone, but he was also a successful front office executive for the Houston Astros, the San Francisco Giants, and the New York Yankees, including their memorable 1978 team. Here's a report on Al Rosen. Al Rosen had a remarkable he had a brief career with the Cleveland Indians. The Indians signed Al Rosen as a amateur free agent in 1942. That actually happened to be the same year that he enlisted in the United States Navy. He served in the Pacific during World War II, navigated an assault boat, and by the time he uh, left the Navy in 1946, he had the rank of lieutenant. You know, in 1947 is when he debuted with the Indians, September 10th against the Yankees at the age of 23 years old, and that's began what was a pretty incredible career over his decade in a Cleveland uniform. Rookie year, he had 37 home runs, kind of establishing himself as one of the great young power hitters in the American League. Played for, with the Indians as a regular from 1950 to 56, and the all-star team four times and was the unanimous choice as the American League MVP in 1953, the last Indians batter to win the MVP honors. You know, his career was pretty remarkable, albeit short. He had 192 home runs. Had the rookie record for home runs in the season in 1950, a record that stood until Mark McGuire broke it in 1987. So he's an Indians Hall of Famer, and if injuries had not shortened his career in a striped uniform, you know, we may have been talking about Al Rosen as a baseball Hall of Famer. Al Rosen was a great interview, and here he talks about his great Cleveland Indian teams of the 1950s. Uh, Bob Feller was in his prime, and uh, Bob Lemon, and just some of the other great pitchers of that era. We're on that ball club, and of course, Lou Boudreau was there. Joe Gordon, who's a Hall of Famer, along with Boudreau. And these fellas could really play. How did you not win every year? Well, <laughs> the Yankees. Here he talks about some of the great players he played with and against. The best hitter, of course, was William. But Willie Mays stands out in my mind as the greatest player that I ever saw. And when Bob Feller used to throw batting practice, which he did in those days, I would not take batting practice. <clears throat> I skipped that part of it because... I felt that he was a goofy-looking guy out on the mound. He had a great fastball. His best pitch was his breaking ball, his curve. He could freeze the batter. Joe DiMaggio, a few years ago, before he passed away, he told me he thought Feller was the best he ever saw. 
One of his teammates was John Berardino, who wasn't much of a ball player, and he had to play behind Joe Gordon. When he left baseball, became an actor, and was a star in General Hospital for 30 years. When I played with him back in 47, 48, and 49, that's all he wanted to do was go to Hollywood and be an actor. And he was a good one. He did a great job on that show. He was a chief man in the front office for the 1978 Yankees. That's the team that won the pennant on the Bucky Dent home run. The Yankees in 78, our pitching staff went down. It was a blood and gut season. Finally, when we made the managerial change in July and brought Bob Lemon in, he settled things down. The pitchers got healthy again. The team went on a winning streak, and the Bucky Dent home run to put us into the series was the, the climax. Uh, winning against the Dodgers in six games was the icing on the cake. It was a great year. Bob Lemon deserves a multitude of credit for uh, being the skipper of a team that was really in disarray, but he brought it all together. Yeah, he doesn't mention the disarrays because of Billy Martin, who he got rid of. Those two didn't like each other. Then again, weren't too many people who did like Billy Martin. The Cleveland sports writer did a documentary a couple years ago on Al Rose, and here are some of the quotes from that documentary. That young feller, that feller's a ball player. He'll give you the works every time. Gets all the hits, gives you the hard tag in the field. That feller's a real competitor. You bet your life. Hall of Fame manager, Casey Stengel. As stellar as Rosen was as a player, it is his character, intelligence, and unassuming courage that mark him as a man among men. Larry Rutten, author of American Jews and America's Game. The greatest thrill in the world is to end the game with a home run and watch everybody walk off the field while you are running the bases on air. Albert Leonard Rosen. Finally, Al Rosen's last thought on himself as a ball player. I do believe that if I completed a career of 12 to 15 years, I would have put up the kind of numbers that at least would give me recognition uh, with the possibility of getting into the hall. We're going to move on now to Natty Revuelta Clues, who died recently at the age of 89. She was the green-eyed beauty who had an affair with Fidel Castro that resulted in a daughter before the Cuban Revolution, and her story is told here by Matthew Bannister of the BBC Four Last Word. Natty Revuelta Clues was the beautiful socialite and revolutionary who had an affair with the future Cuban leader Fidel Castro. Natty was married to a cardiologist and moved in upper-middle-class circles in Havana. But like Castro, she was strongly opposed to the corruption of the dictator Fulgencio Batista. The revolution brought them together and Natty gave birth to Castro's daughter. Jonathan Hansen is a historian at Harvard University. He interviewed Natty for a book he's writing on the young Castro. I asked him how the couple met. The story I heard from Natty's own lips is that Natty decided to alter her path that night on the way home and to stop by the university where she heard there would be a rally. No, she even a black Natty walked by there just to to see what was going on. A friend said to her, Natty, I'd like to introduce you to somebody. Come with me. And she walked over to one of the groups, and there was Fidel Castro talking to a group of friends, and they met. In the aftermath of that, Natty was beginning to hear Fidel's name mentioned more and more. And she said to a friend, here are three keys to my house. I want you to give them to X, Y, and the third to Fidel Castro. And Fidel did use Natty's house to organize the Moncada attack. On July 26, 1953, Fidel Castro orchestrated a quixotic attack on the Moncada military barracks outside of Santiago de Cuba. It was a perfect failure and Fidel ended up going to jail. Natty's mission, as she understood it, was to sustain him through what they thought would be 15 years. That's quite a mission. But in fact, he was released in May 1955. But 10 days before leaving the country, he and Natty got together in an apartment, but the relationship was consummated over what she calls 10 blissful days toward the end of his brief stay in Cuba after he got out of jail. And as a result of those 10 blissful days, Natty became pregnant with Castro's child. And when Alina, Natty's daughter, was born in March 1956, she sent a little ribbon that had come from one of the child's first pieces of clothing and a photograph. And Fidel didn't respond exactly to Natty, but sent his daughter, Alina, a pair of earrings. And then Natty says the next February, 1957, where she got a little note from Fidel with two bullet casings as a souvenir. And then the next time she saw him was a little bit like Hal and Falstaff at the end of Shakespeare's Henry IV, Part Two. It was during Fidel's big speech at Camp Columbia. Los que 
the Nadi pushed her way to the front and she came face to face with Fidel and there was this icy moment where she he looks down and his smile sort of leaves his face and he says to her, Que bueno, Nati? Meaning basically, hi, Nati, everything okay? And that was that. She admitted to me that she was devastated. She was obviously very in love with the man and very committed to him and very committed to what he had just done. Well, I, I've concluded that he loved her when they were together as he loved other people when they were together, but what he was in love with was the revolution. In this period, this frantic, frenetic guy who was always moving, always getting involved in everything, just had to go to his room for 15 or 16 months. And it was during that time that he was able to, with discipline, you know, collect his thoughts, read these great texts, engage these thinkers, engage people like Natty, and, you know, plan his next steps. So I think this was immensely pivotal time in his life, and Natty was just all over this time like nobody else's business. It's hard for me to pinpoint what she taught him, but she contributed to the person he was and the image and vision he had for Cuba. Of course, what the BBC doesn't tell you is that her daughter escaped Cuba and became a strident critic of Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution. Well, we're going to close tonight with the death of circus elephants who are dying at the age of 145. Ringling Brothers Byron and Bailey Circus recently announced the phase-out of circus elephants. I'm going to quote from the Chicago Tribune editorial here. One of the historic logos of the Oakland Athletics is an elephant balancing on a large ball brandishing a baseball bat. The decoration evoked familiar images of the circus, where dancing elephants were long a major draw. But they'll no longer be a draw for the most famous circus of all, Ringling Brothers and Byron Bailey, which has decided to phase out the use of these pachyderms, partly in response, it seems, to regulations enacted in places such as Oakland. For years, animal welfare groups have urged steps like this to protect elephants, and they've made a lot of headway. Several cities, including Oakland and Los Angeles, banned sharply pointed poles known as bull hooks, instruments critics view as cruel to control the giant beasts. Last month, the city of Asheville, North Carolina, directed its U.S. Cellular Center to refrain from contracting with promoters that include any wild or exotic animals, which meant an end to Ringling's visits. The trend shows no sign of stalling. The parent company decided it was tired of resisting. There's been, on the part of the consumers, a mood shift where they may not want to see elephants transported from city to city, said Feld Entertainment President Kenneth Feld. By 2018, the 13 remaining animals will be retired to a 200-acre private conservation area in Florida. All of the resources used to fight these things can be put toward the elephants, said Feld. Still, the decision came as a surprise. When Los Angeles banned the use of bullhooks in 2013, Feld Entertainment vowed to stop going there. It took the view that it wouldn't be a circus without elephants. P.T. Barnum, after all, began featuring them in his shows in 1870. It's pretty remarkable since they've been fighting this fight for so long and for over a century the icon of the American circus was the elephant, historian Matthew Whitman told the New York Times, but Cirque du Soleil has emerged and thrived despite having no animals or because of it and the Big Apple Circus gave up elephants in 2000. The decision is a reflection of shifting attitudes about the treatment of animals. Some food companies have ordered suppliers to stop using tiny pens to house pregnant pigs. Some have renounced eggs produced in cramped cages. Some have insisted that cattle spend most of their lives in pastures, not stalls. These changes have occurred because some consumers demand them and others welcome them. In the end, profit-making companies have to adapt to evolving standards. Otherwise, they risk driving some customers away and damaging the image they want to cultivate. Refusing to change can be a costly distraction. As Feld Entertainment Vice President Stephen Payne told the Los Angeles Times, we're in the business of creating a circus. We want to put smiles on families' faces. We're not in the legislative battle business. Ringling shows will still have plenty of things to enchant a crowd, from clowns to acrobats to tigers. The circus is supposed to be pleasurable, not polarizing. By retiring elephants, Ringling will make it easier to enjoy. Maybe, maybe not. And how about the guys who clean up after them who are going to be out of work? I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And to pay tribute to the circus elephants, we're going to close with the Henry Mancini theme from the 1962 movie Hatari, The Baby Elephant Walk.